I'm really excited to finally be bringing you a video I've been working on for a long time. Probably the single most requested video by everyone in the comments, we're finally going to explain how every single mechanic, keyword and system in the game of Artifact works. There will be timestamps pinned in the comments below, so if you're here for just a specific one, feel free to jump ahead. However, the list has been ordered to explain the entire game from the ground up, so if you want a full understanding of the game of Artifact, stick around as we jump into this mega guide. Similarly to Dota, or a variety of other games existing in the fantasy genre, mana is a resource used to cast your spells. In Artifact, every spell card, creep card and improvement card will have an associated mana cost. To play that card, you will need to spend the mana listed on it from the activated tower. As Artifact has three lanes, each with its own tower, you have three different mana pools from which you can access, only during the time its associated lane is active. Each tower starts with three mana, and at the end of a full round, your mana is replenished and the total available increased by 1. There is no limit to how much mana you can have in Artifact, although games are unlikely to make it past 10 mana totals. A spell card is denoted by this symbol on a card. To play a spell in the active lane, two requirements must be met. Firstly, you need enough remaining mana to be able to cast the spell. You can find the cost for it here. Secondly, you must have a hero of the same colour as your spell card in the active lane, who is unaffected by silence or stun. Spell cards are typically the driving force of any deck, and will largely decide the outcome of a game. Units in Artifact is the combined term for creeps and heroes. Each unit has three stats to be aware of, their attack, armour and health. Attack is how much damage the unit will deal during the combat phase. Armour is a means of damage reduction, all sources of non-piercing damage are reduced by the unit's armour value. Armour also doesn't decrease after use, unless otherwise stated. Health is as you would expect of a card game, it is reduced by the final damage score, attack, minus armour, and then any other special effects in play, and should it reach zero, that unit is then destroyed. When an enemy unit is destroyed by you, whether it be through combat or by other means, you gain gold. You receive 5 gold for a hero kill, and 1 gold for a creep kill. Similarly to spell cards, a creep card also has a mana requirement which must be met, and they need a hero of the same colour as the creep card in the active lane before you can play the card. When played, the creep will spawn where you require it to in the active lane, and it will be assigned a combat target from one of its enemy neighbours. Some creeps will simply be a unit on the board with attack armour and health stats. However, some have abilities, many of which you can activate to gain certain effects to turn the tide of battle. Heroes are at the heart of the game. You pick 5 heroes to join you in battle from a variety of 4 colours. To play any spell, creep or improvement card of any given colour, you must have a hero of that same colour in the active lane. The heroes are more than just simple spellcasters. Heroes typically have stronger stats than creeps, have much stronger abilities, and if they die, they come back to life after one round on the sidelines. Heroes also come with a signature card. If you include a hero in your deck, three copies of their signature card are automatically included. These signature cards often define your deck's win conditions, or provide a great asset to be unleashed. Heroes and their signature cards are the single most important factor to consider when building your deck. Gold is gained from killing enemy units in Artifact, and can be spent on items that vary in power, from the rather useful to the absolutely game winning. There are a number of cards that can increase the gold you receive, or utilise gold in another manner, but it's typically the most common use for gold is to buy items from the shop. Items in Artifact can be purchased for gold during the shopping phase. There are four types of items that you can buy. Weapons, armour, trinkets, also known as health items, and consumables. The first three, weapons, armour and trinkets, are equipable items, which each go into a specific slot on a hero card to upgrade the hero. These usually increase the associated stat, as well as often providing an effect or activatable ability. If an item is already equipped in the desired slot, equipping a new item of that type will overwrite the old one. The final type of items are consumables, and these can be played in any lane regardless of heroes, and usually have an instant effect. Many cards in Artifact have added abilities. These come under three different types, continuous, reactive, and active. Continuous abilities are a constant. They're always ticking over unless something outside of said ability stops them. Reactive abilities trigger at certain events. This can be anything from a unit death to a card of a particular color being played. Once triggered, the listed ability will come into effect. The final type is active abilities. These have a cooldown, measured in turns, and can be activated by the player on their turn as an action. When activated, this ability will take effect, and then go onto its denoted cooldown. All active abilities, except those of heroes, are available as soon as the card is played, whereas heroes abilities start on their maximum length cooldown, and then tick down even if the hero isn't on the board. 
Improvement cards in Artifact represent structures that are played alongside your tower. They have a mana cost, similarly to spells and creeps, but they are a combination of the two. They are untargetable by units and have effects such as spells, but they're persistent on the lane, such as creeps. Improvement cards can currently only be destroyed by a number of card effects that specifically target them. Most improvement cards have this symbol next to the mana cost. This means you can place the card in any lane. This is a symbol not just restricted to the improvements however, so keep an eye out for these. To win a game of Artifact you need to destroy two enemy towers, or one enemy tower and the enemy ancient. There is one tower for each player in each of the three lanes, and they start with 40 health. If you destroy a tower, it will be replaced by the Ancient, which has 80 health. Towers and Ancients themselves do no damage. Instead, they are the vessels for your mana, allowing you to cast your spells and summon creeps. This is the Artifact board. We've already covered the absolute basics, so let me take this opportunity to walk through the display. Starting from your own perspective, this is your hand, the cards you are currently able to play. You will notice the style of your side of the board differs from that of your opponents. In this scenario, you are the Dire player, and you are against the Radiant player. As a Dire player, you go second on the first round, and your little limp helper is Nox. Equally, the Radiant player went first, and their little friend is called Lux. Moving over, we see your current gold and your initiative coin, and then we get to the board itself. Front and centre are the towers. To the left of those, the current mana of that tower, and to the right, the current health of the tower. Then, we have the playing area itself, housing all of the units. If too many units are played, a notification will display on the board to suggest that there are more units hidden to the side, which you can scroll across to see. Each unit will have an arrow. This arrow shows in which direction the unit will be attacking during the combat phase. Your opponent's hand, gold and initiative coin are a mirror of your own. To the side of the board we see the history log, which allows you to see the most recently played cards, and finally in the top left corner of the user interface is the minimap. This gives you an overview of the entire game. The far left block shows heroes in the fountain and how long until they will return to the board. A check mark denotes that the hero will return in the coming deployment phase and the negative number shows how many turns away they are. Next to that we have the three lanes and the hero portraits showing you where each hero is as well as the tower or ancient health of each lane. If there is a cross through any of them it shows that they would take lethal damage during the next combat phase in that lane. Finally there is the initiative arrow. This signifies who will have the initiative in the next lane and therefore who will go first. The initiative in Artifact denotes which player will have the next turn. It is marked in two places, the coins next to each player's hand, and then the initiative arrow on the minimap. The player with the initiative coin is the active player, who can now take their turn. If they make any action, they will pass the coin to the other player, who will then have the initiative to take their turn. The initiative arrow on the minimap shows who will have the first initiative coin in the next lane. By passing your turn first, you gain the initiative for the next lane. However, if the opponent makes an action, that arrow will be reset and you will need to pass again. A round in Artifact is the name for a full turn, going through all three lanes and back to where you started. Each round is made up of four different phases, two of which repeat in each lane. Firstly, there is the deployment phase. Then you move into lane one and you have an action phase followed by a combat phase. Then we move into lane two and have an action phase and a combat phase. And then, as you may have guessed, we have an action phase and a combat phase in lane 3. Finally, there is the shopping phase, and we will now go through each of these in a bit more detail for you. At the very beginning of each round in Artifact, you have the deployment phase, with the exception of the very first round. The deployment phase spawns two melee creeps for each you and your opponent, and they can go into any of the three lanes. If a hero had previously died and had spent the allotted one turn on the sidelines, then they will now respawn from the fountain in the deployment phase, and you can pick which lane they would like to go into. Your imps, Lux and Nox, then go lane by lane, shuffling your new hero and creep deployments around and placing them down in random eligible spaces in each lane. Where there are gaps, a pathing card will spawn to show you which way the unblocked unit will be attacking. The very first round is a little different though. Each player will get three creeps assigned to random lanes and three heroes, one in each lane. You will get to decide when your heroes are played from the deck builder. You pick which three heroes you wish to appear in the first turn. You then pick your fourth hero, which will be available in the second round of deployment phase, and your fifth hero, which will be available in your third round deployment phase. While we already have a more in-depth guide to the action phase, let me quickly run over the basics for you. The action phase is the first thing to happen in each lane. Before the action phase in lane 1, for each round, you will get to draw two cards, and then the action phase itself begins. The player with the initiative has the first action, and will decide what to do. Then, by taking an action, they will pass the initiative coin over to the next player, who will get to make an action of their own. 
There is a variety of actions you can take, but you can only take one of these each time you get the initiative coin. You can cast a spell, play an item, use an ability, be that on an improvement, a hero, a creeper, or an item, or you can click on the initiative coin itself, effectively passing your turn and keeping the initiative arrow for the next lane. Once both players have consecutively hit the pass button, the action phase will end and the combat phase will begin. After the action phase in each lane comes the combat phase. There is little to do here other than watch, but it certainly is a spectacle. Before this phase, you'll see many numbers in boxes next to the units on the field. This number is how much damage, if any, they will take during combat. So ideally, you already know the outcome of battle. Once the units have clashed together and exchanged damage, any creeps that die will grant the killer 1 gold and will be discarded from the game, and any heroes that die will grant the killer 5 gold and will go to the fountain, or the sidelines, for one whole round before being available in the deployment phase yet again. Combat is decided by the arrows that appear above every unit. These show in which direction that the particular unit will attack. The three options are straight, left, and right. If there is a unit directly opposite yours, and no spells have been played to manipulate this, then it will 100% of the time have a straight combat arrow, forcing it to attack forwards. However, if there is no enemy opposite your unit, then the three options come into play, and an arrow will be designated by your imps, Lux and Nox, during the deployment phase. In these cases, there is a 50% chance of a straight arrow, a 25% chance of a left arrow, and a 25% chance of a right arrow. These combat target arrows are very easy to manipulate in Artifact, with spells, items and improvements all being able to affect their direction. However, simply moving a unit will not change the arrows. For example, if you use phase boots to swap a hero with a right arrow for a creep with a straight arrow, the hero will inherit the straight arrow and the creep will inherit the right arrow. There are enough tidbits regarding combat arrows to fill an entire video, but this should get you through the basics. The shopping phase comes after the final combat phase in lane 3. The dust has settled and it's time to spend your hard earned gold. As you enter this phase, a new user interface will be dragged to the front of your screen. The shop. Here you will see three panels. The right panel is the consumables tab, and here there will be one of four consumables on sale. You will randomly be offered either a healing salve, a fountain flask, a time portal scroll, or a potion of knowledge. These are all relatively low cost items that will help you on your way. The central slot is your own item deck. In the deck builder, you will have to assign at least nine items to this slot, one of which will be presented to you. Unlike the other two slots, however, when you buy an item from the item deck slot, the next item in your deck will be presented. In this way, you can keep buying from the middle slot until you've run out of gold, should it please you. Finally, the leftmost slot. This is the secret shop and has one random item from all the items in the game. This can either end up as a completely useless slot, or it might provide the secret weapon for crushing your enemy at the perfect time. Each time you load up the shop, a new item will be on display, However, there is the option to spend one gold to hold your secret shop item if it really is perfect but you don't quite have enough gold yet. Once the shopping phase is over, so is the round, and you move on to the next one, starting anew with the deployment phase. A number of artifact effects state the keyword neighbours when targeting units. Neighbour specifically means the unit either side of the current target. If your hero has an ability that grants armour to allied neighbours, then friendly units either side of that hero will get that armour. An example of this being used on enemies would be a spell that damages an enemy and its neighbours. This would deal the damage to one unit you target, as well as the enemy unit either side of that target. Unless stated otherwise, cards that affect all heroes or all units will apply only in the current lane. This is quite regularly seen as give all allies something, and can conversely be give all enemies something. In both examples, the effect would only apply to units in the active lane. When changing the state of a card in Artifact, there are two different ways that can be applied. The default is a temporary application. The card might read, give allied heroes cleave this round, which will pretty much do as it describes. Your heroes will have cleave for the remainder of this round. However, modify, the other option, is a permanent effect. If an ability modifies something, that modification lasts until the end of the game, even if applied to a hero, persisting through death. However, it can be removed by purging effects, and is currently the only way we know to remove a modification. Condemn is Artifact's version of Destroy. For example, if you cast a spell that says Condemn a Creep, then you pick the Creep and it will be destroyed immediately. It's a very simple concept, but a very, very fruitful one. Cleave is a unique damage stat that isn't displayed directly on a card. Cleave damage is dealt to your combat target's neighbours and does not take into account your own attack, only your cleave damage. For example, if you equipped an item that granted you plus 2 cleave, then you would only deal 2 damage to your combat target's neighbours, even if your own attack stat was much higher. 
Damage immunity is an effect that can be applied to units that blocks all sources of incoming damage. The only way to remove health from the affected unit is through modification or removing previous modifications that increase the unit's health, such as items. Damage immune units, though, are still susceptible to condemn and is frequently the easiest way to kill a damage immune unit. Death Shield is a buff that can be applied to units. When active, the Death Shield will prevent the next death of the unit, keeping it alive on just one health. This will prevent any sort of death, including Condemn. Once it has triggered, the effect will be gone, and the unit will be vulnerable once again. The next death hit will destroy it. Disarm is a debuff which prevents the affected unit from attacking. The units can still be attacked, and any of the unit's effects will still trigger unless they require you to be attacking in order for them to take effect. Piercing damage is a type of damage that ignores any positive armour. If an enemy has two armour for example, two incoming damage would normally be reduced to zero. However, two piercing damage goes straight through, dealing that two damage anyway. Important to note here, negative armour still buffs piercing damage. So two piercing damage to a target with negative one armour will do three damage total. Calculations in Artifact are usually done in one movement. Each spell, each unit in combat, all deal their damage and resolve their effects instantly. However, Pulse, denoted by the two rotating arrows on a card, deals damage or resolves effects over a number of instances. As each Pulse strikes, all damage modification, effects and abilities are taken into account, and after each Pulse, these are also updated. This can drastically change the amount of damage done. This means, for instance, if a unit has armour, then every Pulse will be reduced by that amount, or if they have negative armour, every Pulse will be increased by that amount. Rapid Deployment is the mechanic to get around heroes spending rounds out in the fountain. If modified with Rapid Deployment, a hero will immediately be available for deployment, only missing out on what little is left of the current round, and already being back in the fray, ready for the next one. Regeneration is similar to armour in Artifact. It is another substat, such as Cleave or Siege, that heals the unit for its amount during the combat phase. Regeneration is applied before checking for death. So, for example, if your hero has 2 health left and is going to take 3 damage from battle, but has 2 regeneration, then your hero will survive on 1 health. Retaliate is yet another substat, similar to Cleave or Siege, that deals damage to units that attack you. Therefore, if a unit has Retaliate 2, they will deal 2 damage to any unit that attacks it, be that during the combat phase or the action phase as a result of an action. Retaliation damage is counted as a separate instance of damage from your regular attack though, so any armour or effect modifiers will apply to the retaliation damage separately from your basic attacks. When blocked during the combat phase, in addition to battle damage to the combat target, siege damage will also be dealt to the enemy tower. However, if your unit is not blocked, the siege damage is not dealt to the tower, only your regular attack damage will strike. So this is a way of getting damage on the enemy tower even if you're being blocked. Silence is a debuff in Artifact that prevents any hero from casting spells or a unit from using abilities. However, if you have two heroes of the same colour in a lane, and only one of those is silenced, you can continue to cast spells of that colour using the unsilenced hero. Stun is a debuff in Artifact. It is effectively the combination of Disarm and Silence. You cannot use a stunned unit's ability, and you cannot use them to cast spells, nor will they attack during the combat phase or action phase. You may, however, still equip items to a stunned hero, or use abilities and cards on that stunned unit. Taunt in Artifact is a particular manipulation of combat target arrows. Taunting will force the enemy directly opposite your taunting unit, as well as its neighbours, to move their combat targeting arrows towards your taunting unit. These arrows can then be manipulated further, but if not, the enemy units will be forced to attack the taunting unit during the combat phase. And that is the last of our sections. If you stuck around until the very end, then thank you. I hope this was helpful to you, and if there's anything else you'd like us to make a guide for, or explain in some more detail, then please let us know in the comments below. As always, likes and subscribes really help the channel out, so if this guide was useful to you, then please hit those subscribe buttons to support us.